All right, Spencer, the time is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to spend some time with each of you. It's a uh, it's an interesting world we live in today that allows us to to do this where we can uh, we can spend time let me do I'm just adjusting my view so I can see the whole room there we go um, it's how's it going it, it's it's an interesting thing it's it's a little uh, it's different since COVID uh, entered the world I've I've done a few of these webinar type things and the they're not my favorite. I, I wish I could be with you guys. I wish we could be in the room together and, and feel each other's energy and, and spirit. Um, but at the same time, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be you know, half a world away and still be able to share this time together. Um, it's, it, it's a powerful thing that technology has allowed us to do. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about uh, the Christmas season a little bit. I love this time of year. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Uh, I, I, growing up, I, thinking of the Christmas story, I, I always I used to reflect on uh, the shepherds um, a little bit. I, I grew up, as was mentioned, on a dairy farm. Uh, we also had sheep. Um, we had uh, horses. We had um, pigs. We had all kinds of all kinds of animals. It was more like a ranch, really. It, it, there was all kinds of different animals and. Um, but we, I, I come from six generations of sheep herders, actually, uh, which are a little different than shepherds. Um, if you're familiar, a, a sheep herder, I guess some of the principal differences is a sheep herder, um, it, the biggest difference is where they stand in relation to their sheep. Um, a sheep herder often stands behind the sheep and pushes them along. Um, they use the tactic of fear. Uh, to motivate their sheep to move. Uh, they don't name their sheep. And the relationship is nothing much more than utility. Um, a shepherd, however, has a very different experience with their flock. Um, a shepherd walks in front of or amongst their flock, and they move with their sheep. Um, their relationship is, is very different. They name each one of their sheep. By tradition and their relationship is one of love um, and it's a very intimate connection and I, I, I think that's why the Savior chose to use a shepherd and flock to describe the relationship that he has with us. I think it's fitting um, it, when, when you think of the Christmas story that shepherds were the first, uh, the first witness of the birth of the Savior um it's also it's also interesting to understand I, I did some research on who were these shepherds um growing up I, we'd read about these shepherds that showed up and you know with the wise men and when I was little I was like well they're wise so it makes sense that they're there but who were these shepherds and why were they there um I came across something interesting a few years ago Alfred Edersheim wrote a book called the life and times of Jesus the Messiah and in that book, he speaks of the um, a flock that was dedicated to the use within the temple. Um, so the firstborn male of a ewe would be used um, to as a sacrificial lamb um, as part of the flock of the the Migdal Eder and and. The in this book, Alfred Edersheim explains that the Migdal Eder, this flock, was kept in the fields of Bethlehem. And he surmised, and, and many other scholars um, agree, that these shepherds weren't just random shepherds, but that they were the shepherds keeping watch over the temple flock. And um, that their role was to witness of the firstborn male lamb um, sufficient to be used in sacrifice and how fitting then for these shepherds to attend the birth of the firstborn lamb of our father in heaven and witness of his sanctity and his worthiness 
to be our savior. Um, Christ's relationship as a lamb, um, it, it developed and grew. He also became a shepherd, our shepherd, the good shepherd, the perfect shepherd. And as our shepherd, he he uh, he has requirements for us. He has expectations. And, and sometimes growing up, I felt that the expectations of us were a bit much. Has anyone else ever felt that? That expectations are a little too much? Has anyone else ever felt the, uh, the expectation to be perfect? Um, I felt that. I felt overwhelmed by that for a majority of my life. I'll, I'll share actually a quick a football story with you. Um, I, I got to go back to when I was very little. Um, I started playing football when I was about 10 years old. And uh, if you would have asked the 10-year-old Spencer what his greatest fear was, it was that he was going to die before he ever got a chance to play a real game of football, which I know is a little twisted for a 10-year-old to be <laughs> thinking that way, but that's how I felt. And I remember the, the first year that I was supposed to play football um, was getting ready for the season, was supposed to start like the next week. And I was all excited. It was the first time I was going to be able to put on like a helmet and shoulder pads and, and be able to go hit somebody and not get in trouble by mom. And uh, I remember walking into my mom's room and she was on the phone and she was, oh, oh no, he'll be so sad. That's a bummer. And, and I'll let him know and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there going, man, this can't be good. And she gets off the phone and she says, hey, bud, I, I want to tell you something. I'm sorry. They, they canceled. Uh, your like the the grade that I was going to play in the football team because they don't they didn't have a coach and I you know started crying and she's oh it's okay you can play next year and I was like no mom you don't understand uh, I'm gonna die this year I just know it and she's like what the heck's wrong with my kid um but I was I was convinced I thought man I, I'm not gonna make it to next year I just knew it my greatest fear is being realized I'm never gonna play football uh, and I tell you this just to paint a picture of how much, and I don't know where this came from. I don't, my, my dad played football, but he didn't force this on me by any means. But it was like I was just born with this innate obsession with the game of football. I loved it, and I just wanted to play. And, uh, and, and that translated. When I played football, I was, all, I, I was known. I played with a lot of passion. I run around and I was kind of crazy and, and uh, would just throw my body all over the place and, and, you know, endure a lot of injuries, but I just, I loved the game. It was just, I don't know where, again, where it came from. It just was there. I just loved it. And, and that was how I always played and how I approached the game of football with a ton of passion. Well, as was mentioned um, by Patrick, I, I, after playing college football, I had the opportunity to play professionally for a little bit. My first little professional stint was with the new Orleans saints when I got there, um, I was so scared. I, I, I was so just afraid of making a mistake. I knew that, you know, I was a rookie. I was low on the totem pole. And, and I just felt, man, if, if I go out there and I make a mistake, they're going to cut me. And, and, I, and then, I'm, you know, my dreams of playing in the NFL are going to be shattered and it's going to be all over with. And it was all of this pressure on myself to be perfect actually caused me to approach the game with much less passion and much less drive and much less desire. In fact, when we would go out to practice, I remember sitting on the sideline and, excuse me, not wanting to get any reps. I, I didn't want the coach to put me in because that was an opportunity for me to make a mistake to then get cut which makes no sense because if I don't get in, then I don't have an opportunity to make a play and show him that I belong there. Right. So it, it was so backwards, but this obsession or this, uh, this fear of making a mistake actually kept me from reaching my potential. Well, surprise, surprise, I got cut from the saints. And fortunately I got picked up by another team, the Oakland Raiders and things worked out a little bit differently, but I'll come back to that, that story. So I, I, I want to talk to you about this pressure that we sometimes feel. Sometimes we put it on ourselves to be perfect. Um, some of you earlier kind of nodded your head and raised your hands that you, you felt that way. Um, I'll just assume that we've all felt that way. I think it's common actually in this church to feel that way, 
Um, do we have, do we have audio? If I talk to the group, can they respond or is it muted on, on your end? They should have a microphone there or we can ask somebody online that's watching online. Yeah, we do have a microphone. Yeah, yeah that'd be great either way. Would, would someone, um, and do you have, we've all got our phones. Can someone pull up um, their scriptures? And, and can we have someone read Matthew 5, verse 48? This is while we're getting there. And if we've got a volunteer, the, oh, there's a hand there in the back. Thank you. Um, Matthew 5, 48. This is the Savior. While in his earthly ministry, he's giving what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and, and this is kind of the very end. Um, and he gives us a commission. We're going to see. I want to see if this scripture helps us a little bit with this expectation we have to be perfect. Go ahead and read it. Uh, be therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Does that help? <laughs> no, right? It's like, I, I'll be honest. When I Thank you for reading that. When I read that scripture growing up, I used to scratch my head and go, what the heck is he talking about? And then you cross-reference that with Romans, right? 3.23, which says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I was like, man, are we conflicting messages here? Like be perfect, but everyone has sinned. So uh, good luck with that. So what is he talking about? First of all, what is our definition of perfect? Does anyone want to, we can kind of blurt out anyone who's online, or if we've got some in the room, raise your hand and we can bring the mic to you. What, what's the definition of perfect? What's some good synonyms? Go ahead. I think uh, the purpose to be better. I think the purpose to be better the higher uh, goals, the uh, higher achievements you can get. Like small uh, dreams uh, can bring you a small result. Big dreams can bring bigger results. I love that. We had, yeah, another hand. Sorry, Silva. <laughs> no, uh, for me, I would just say Jesus Christ. It's my definition of perfect. Beautiful. Absolutely. I would say perfect in trying. Ooh. Like trying is perfect for me. I like that. I think all of you are onto something very, very, and, and each one of your answers, though slightly different, they actually all connect, and, and, and we're going to draw that connection. Did anyone else want to share? Okay, so so what we'll do, I, I want to go to the, the, uh, the dictionary definition of the word perfect. Um, it's an adjective, and the, the, the first 1A definition is being entirely without fault or defect and the synonym they use is flawless um that is a definition of perfect that is and 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 as was said by the yellow sweater in the back jesus christ is our definition of perfect flawless yes perfect um without fault or defect and i testify to you that he was i know that he was and because he was he became our savior. And we're going to talk about what that means then for us. But, but perhaps, perhaps a second layer or another meaning, the, the savior always taught in layers and always taught with you know, duality of meanings or, or multiple meanings, meanings. So let's read perhaps another scripture. Third Nephi, if we can go there. Third Nephi chapter 12, verse 48. Now, this is interesting because this is nearly, it's the same person talking, it's the Savior, and it's nearly the same address, but he's giving this to the Nephites when he appears to them after his, uh, his um, crucifixion and resurrection. He appears to the Nephites, right? We have this beautiful appearance in 3rd Nephi chapter 11. Well, he, he teaches them, and he gives essentially the same sermon, this Sermon on the Mount, but there are some minor differences but they have uh, profound, uh, great uh, meanings in, in their difference. So 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 48. It's nearly the same verse as the one we just read, but there's a difference. Let's see if we can spot it, please. Okay, so therefore, I would that you should be perfect even as I am, or your father who is in heaven is perfect. Interesting. Did anyone catch the difference there between those two verses? What was it? They're very, very similar, but there was a difference. 
So it says here, um, it's therefore I would that you should be perfect even as I. Uh, there is no as I in, in Matthew. Bingo. Right. So, so this second time he includes himself in, in this invitation to each of us to be perfect. Now, um, there are some obvious differences between the Savior when giving the Sermon on the Mount as a mortal man, well, part mortal, and when he is giving this sermon to the Nephites, being a resurrected and perfected being. But if we're using the definition that we just read from the dictionary of without defect or the synonym of flawless, wasn't he flawless before? Isn't that why he was able to perform the atonement? Was because he was flawless? Yes. Technically, you could say that he had the flaw of mortality. That's true. That's true. You could technically say that he was not uh, fully uh, uh, celestial, right? He wasn't a celestial being. So that, that is accurate. But as far as without sin, right, the Savior was without sin. And again, I testify that he was. So what what does this word perfect mean in this context when the savior is inviting us if it means to be without sin or to be flawless then he ought to have included himself the first time because he was flawless now back to the dictionary there's a second definition 1b it says satisfying all requirements now that's interesting because the savior who was speaking to the Jews in Jerusalem had not yet satisfied all of the requirements of the father, right? There was still something left for him to accomplish. So if we use that definition, it works that the savior at that point had not yet satisfied the requirements of Elohim, our father. So what are the requirements of our father in heaven? Well, it's quite simple. You have to be perfect. No unclean thing can dwell in his presence. We read that over and over. He cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. So for us, that requirement from our father in heaven is very strict. And I don't think it's because he's not a loving father. He is a loving father. But it's strict because it has to be. Because he is God. Because he cannot look upon sin with any degree of allowance. We must be perfect to be in his presence. Now, this is what's so beautiful about this time of year and about the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is that he came and he fulfilled that requirement. And he fulfilled that requirement not just for himself, but for you and for me. And for anyone that ever lived, he fulfilled that requirement from our Father in heaven to be perfect. And he then turns to us and he gives us a new set of requirements. A set of requirements that we can reach, that we can accomplish. And we're going to talk about what those requirements are. Um, Third Nephi, chapter 27, verse 19 and 20. This is... Spencer Hadley's favorite scripture. Well, scriptures, I guess there's two of them. But um, do I have someone that would be willing to read 3 Nephi 27, 19, and 20? This is, um, the Savior is still amongst the Nephites here in the Americas. And he's still teaching them. And uh, these two scriptures are, the, the for me, the most clearest and succinct definition of the requirements of the Savior for each one of us. Sorry, do we have a reader? Yes, okay, great. Go ahead and, and read those, please. And no unclean thing can enter into his kingdom. Therefore, nothing entereth into his rest, save it be those who have washed their garments in my blood because of their faith and the repentance of all their sins and their faithfulness unto the end. Now, this is the commandment. Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. Brothers and sisters, that's it right there. In those two verses, we understand 
the requirements that the Savior has for us. Um, he, he talks to us about faith. He talks to us about repentance. He talks to us about uh, baptism. And he talks to us about receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, the, the sanctifying presence of that member of the Godhead. And he talks about us. He talks to us about uh, enduring unto the end or faithfulness unto the end. And those five principles, the doctrine of Christ is what the Savior calls it. The doctrine of Christ or his gospel are the requirements that he has given to us to be, as it says in the verse from the Savior himself, that ye may stand spotless before me at the last day. If we, if we want to be perfect, live the doctrine of Christ. And, and, and I love uh, the sister right here in the middle. You, you, you talked about try. That's really what it is. That's really what the Savior wants from us is to try. And to keep trying. And that no matter how many times we fall or how many times we slip up or how many times we don't quite get it right, don't give up. Don't you dare give up. Just keep trying. That's his invitation. That's his requirement for us. See, see, see the invitation isn't become perfect. The, 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 it is, but the invitation isn't someday at some point be perfect like me and your father. It's be, it's now, it's today. It's be ye therefore perfect. And these requirements, living the doctrine of Christ, is how we can do that. Now, let's dissect the doctrine of Christ just a little bit. Let's talk about faith. What is faith? Faith is believing in something, right, that we can't see or that we don't know. It's interesting that to have faith requires a little bit of doubt to be present. Um, if we had a perfect knowledge like Alma taught, it wouldn't be faith. And so there, it requires a little bit of uncertainty. We have to walk without all the answers, right? We don't know everything. Exercising faith requires us to carry with us just a little bit of doubt. But the invitation is to let our faith overcome our doubt and overpower our doubt and move forward. Faith is not a passive belief. Um, it requires action. Um, it, it, it it requires us to do something about our faith. And that action that it requires is repentance. Um, I want to talk about repentance and the power of repentance. I think sometimes, at least for me, and, and maybe you felt this way too, growing up um, as a youth and, and, and even today, sometimes I hear the word repent. And uh, there's a little bit of like a negative connotation to it for me. It's like repent it's like oh i'm being chastised <laughs> you know what i mean i don't know if you feel that way i feel that way sometimes and 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 it's just the opposite um the invitation to repent is not a chastisement it, it it's a celebration honestly it's uh it is the glad tidings um of great joys that we have the opportunity to repent and to shed our old selves and to change i want to share a quick story um you probably know this story, but I found something in this story that was very insightful to me. Um, the sons of Helaman, or sorry, sorry, so the sons of Mosiah and Alma, the younger, were an interesting group of, of men. They, uh, they were kind of all over the place throughout the course of their life. The early days being very rebellious and the scriptures say seeking to destroy the kingdom of God. Um, in fact, there was a very harsh statement in the scriptures. Uh, now, we've all made mistakes, right? Every single one of us. But I don't know that any of us qualify to be referred to as this. I'm going to read in, in Mosiah chapter 28, verse 4. It says, um, and thus did the spirit of the Lord work upon them. It's talking about um, um, the sons of Mosiah and, and Alma the younger. It says, for they were the very vilest of sinners. Yikes. <laughs> anyone, anyone else think they're the very vilest of sinners? I don't think so. <laughs> we, we've all made mistakes. We've all made mistakes, but I, I don't believe 
just just by the fact that you're here now um i don't believe that any of us qualify to be described as the very vilest of sinners yet these men were and they had an interesting experience um while going it says they were on the road um essentially seeking to destroy the church an angel appeared to them i know many of us are familiar with this story some of us may not be so we'll recap it an angel appeared to them and they had such an experience and in some ways it was quite violent the the earth shook they fell to the ground um and the angel rebuked them and they still had their agency they were told that they could continue to be the way that they were being, but that they would be destroyed if they were, if they would continue. And it was an invitation for them to change. Well, it left Alma in a coma for nearly three days. Um, and, and the other sons of Messiah, they were changed forever through this experience. Now, that alone was not enough to change them. However, they did change. They made a mighty change in their life. Um, Alma chapter 48. This scripture is often used to describe uh, Captain Moroni, who was a very valiant man. Um, it said in verse 17, it says, Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, if all men had been and were and ever would be like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. Yea, the devil would never have power over the hearts of the children of men. What a cool description of somebody. I wish that was me that it was talking about. Um, and I usually, I, I used to stop there at that verse and think, man, you know, Captain Moroni was quite the guy, um, probably had a six pack too, you know, just probably all around just a stud, you know, <laughs> but, but the next verse, the next verse, I, I, I read this a few years ago and it kind of hit me like, like I'd never seen it before. You know, you ever have that experience where you read a scripture and there's something in there and you're like, oh my gosh. How did I not see this? Well, I read the next verse and it, it was one of those moments for me. It says, behold, he was a man like unto Ammon, the son of Mosiah. Yea, and even the other sons of Mosiah. Yea, and also Alma and his sons, for they were all men of God. Now, how do we go right from being the very vilest of sinners to being the type of person that if men and women would be like these guys, Satan would have no power over the children of men. The very powers of hell would be shaken forever. Talk about a comeback story. Talk about a contrast. Um, that is the power of repentance. That is why when we hear the invitation to repent or to change is the meaning of the word. It is a celebration and not a rebuke. It's an opportunity for us to have a change, to experience a change of heart, to become a new creature in Christ, to go from the very vilest of sinners to being the type of men that if all men and women would be like them, Satan would have no power. Uh, the, the opportunity to repent is perhaps the greatest gift that has ever been given. And greater than any present we expect to see on the 25th of this month, um, the opportunity to become like the Savior in increments as we continue to try. So repentance means to change, as we see in the, the sons of Messiah. Now, we've been invited to, to be baptized. Um, if there are any in the room who have not been baptized, um, the invitation is extended to you to be baptized, but to be baptized by someone who holds the authority. Um, quick, quick little description. We, the Savior was baptized. He was flawless, right, as we discussed, yet he was baptized. Why? He tells us that it was to fulfill all righteousness. Um, it, is, it is asked of us of God to be baptized. However, we all understand the story that the Savior went from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Well, why? Why, why did he walk? I think it was like 30 some odd miles um, from where he was in Galilee to, to where at least it's, it's estimated that where John the Baptist was for most of his ministry. 
Um, and, and we're not talking about, you know, calling an Uber, or hopping in a car and driving these 30 plus miles. He walked and he didn't have the newest Nike cross trainers. He was wearing sandals and this wasn't a paved road or a nice hiking trail. It was rough terrain through the mountains. And so why? Why did he travel all that way to go to John? Well, it was because John held the priesthood authority. Um, we learned that John is a son of Levi, which means he was of the tribe of Levi, therefore held the priesthood. And not only that, he was a descendant of Aaron, which means that he held the Aaronic priesthood, which is the priesthood that is appropriate to perform baptism. And may have been the only person at that time who was living the law of Moses and held that priesthood worthily. So the Savior walked all that distance for a reason, because it was sufficient, it was required uh, to be baptized, but to be baptized by one holding authority. So many of us have been baptized. Uh, what does that mean then? Well, we renew those covenants every Sunday um, when we partake of the sacrament. When I was eight years old, I remember driving home from my baptism and thinking to myself, man, I messed up. I should have waited and gotten baptized when I was like 85 because now I have to be perfect the rest of my life and I can't make any mistakes. And this is the last time I'm going to be clean. And I almost know I'm going to fight with my brother tomorrow. And all these thoughts were going through my head. Well, I didn't understand. I didn't understand that when we partake of the sacrament every Sunday, we have the opportunity to renew those covenants and renew that washing that takes place. Now, when we're baptized, the cleansing doesn't come from us going in the water. That's only symbolic, right? The cleansing comes from the Holy Ghost being present in our lives. And as we receive the Holy Ghost, we, uh, we are cleansed. Um, and that's not a one-time reception, right? We, we are only, uh, the Holy Ghost is conferred upon us once, and it's interesting in that, in that uh, confirmation, the words are said, I say unto you, receive the Holy Ghost. Not, uh, I say unto you, the Holy Ghost will now be with you forever and always, regardless of what you do. We have to receive that gift. We have to receive his presence. Um, and so when we make a mistake and he can no longer dwell with us because Alma taught us that he can't dwell in unholy tabernacles, then we go back to step one. We exercise faith and we repent and we renew our covenants and we receive the Holy Ghost again. Um, a, a, a quick, very quick um, demonstration, I, I think, of the power of the spirit, because the Holy Ghost is not only a cleanser, but it's a teacher and it teaches us. And it's a gift that can guide us through our lives, as many of us are aware. But I, I think this is just a powerful illust illustration of that. Alma, the younger who was with the sons of Mosiah, right, who had this transformative experience where the, the angel comes and kind of knocks them off their feet, not kind of literally knocks them off their feet. Um, he, he, it changes him forever, right? He later becomes the prophet of the church, and he's going around and he's teaching. And in Alma chapter 5, it's, it's actually one of my favorite sermons in the Book of Mormon. It's so powerful. When we read this, it's, it's impossible to read this chapter and if we ask ourselves truly the questions that he poses, we cannot be the same after we come out the other end of this, this uh, chapter. It's a beautiful chapter that causes us to reflect. But he, he's testifying to them. He's teaching them of truth. And in verse 46 of Alma chapter 5, he says, uh, or sorry, verse 45, he says, and this is not all. Do you suppose that I know of these things myself? Behold, I testify unto you that I do know that these things whereof I have spoken are true. And how do you suppose that I know of their surety? Behold, I say unto you, they are made known unto me by the Holy Spirit of God. Now that's interesting because here we have a man who had an experience where an angel literally came down from heaven and knocked him unconscious for three days. And he doesn't mention anything about that. When testifying that he knows of the truth and telling his reason of why he knows or how he has come to know that, he doesn't reference the experience where an angel of God came and knocked him off his feet. He talks about the Holy Spirit. He says, behold, I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things of myself. And now I do know of myself that they are true. For the Lord God hath made them manifest unto me 
by his Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, that's the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. That's the power of having the Spirit. That witness is literally greater than if, it, than if an angel came to you on your way home this evening and told you that these things are true. The daily confirmation of the Spirit and the presence of the Holy Ghost in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis is, is the greatest testimony that we can receive. Now, when we receive the Holy Ghost, all is not done. Um, the Lord invites us to endure to the end. And, and I'm going to close with this thought. The word endure, the Latin root of the word is indurare, which means to become like steel. It's, uh, it's, I always thought of the word endure as like, just, you know, hang on to the end, you know, like you're kind of, you're hanging on by your fingertips and you're barely making it, but you endure, you cross the finish line. You're like, oh, we made it. But the opposite is true. The true meaning of the word endure means to get stronger as time goes on. That as we work through this journey of life, we get stronger. We make mistakes along the way, but we go back to step one. And we exercise faith and we repent and we renew our covenants and we receive again a greater portion of the Holy Spirit. And we get stronger as we experience that. And that's the invitation of, the Spirit, of, of our Heavenly Father. That's the requirement. That the, that the Savior gave to us. See, we can't earn heaven, but we do need to qualify for Christ's compassion. And these requirements are how we qualify. And the, and, and the Savior paid the ultimate sacrifice for each one of us. He fulfilled that requirement of living a flawless life for each one of us and gave us this doctrine, these five principles, and, and we can be perfect in that. We can continue to try. We can, no matter how many mistakes we make, we can go back to step one, and we can get stronger as each day goes on. I testify that that's true. That's what Moroni taught us when he said that we are perfect in Christ and not perfect for Christ but we are perfect in Christ. I testify that that's true. Now, now what? Uh, one of the things I often ask myself after each scripture study is, therefore what? What did I learn? What does it mean? What do I do with it? Now what? Now that we understand better <clears throat> this relationship we have with the Savior and what he requires of us and what it means to be perfect, now what? First, I want to say that... The doctrine of Christ is not a license to sin. And I know you know that, but I always, I feel like that always has to be said. This isn't a license to sin. Premeditated sin is not okay. We can't, we can't say, oh, well, I'm going to sin and I'll just go back to step one and have faith and repent and blah, blah, blah. Um, yes, we can always repent, even if that was our intention, but that's not the way that this works. To repent means to change. And so if we're just planning to sin, we're not changing. We're not truly repenting and we aren't becoming like the savior. So I think that's important to know. Uh, President Hinckley, when asked, um, are we going to make it? Um, are we enough? Will we make it? He said, yes, yes, you will, but you have to try. And then he stopped and he said, you have to really try. So we have to try and we have to really try. We have to live the doctrine of Christ. Um, back to the very beginning, we talked about these shepherds. Um, they witnessed the birth of the Savior. And in Luke 2, verse 17, it says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. This Christmas season and always, let us make known abroad the glad tidings of joy. The, the message concerning this child that we celebrate this month and all year that the savior was born into this earth, that he came and he lived a flawless and a perfect life. And he fulfilled that requirement for each of us. And he gave us a way to also be perfect so that we can live with our father in heaven again, with our family and our loved ones. I testify that it's true. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, Spencer.
as I listen to you teach the doctrine of Christ and testify of it and share scriptures about it, I felt the spirit and I believe everybody else did as well. And so I can also add my testimony. I know it's true. So thank you very, very much for bringing the spirit to us here today. Thank you. Uh, did you want to take any questions or did you want to? Uh... Sure. Yeah, yeah. If anyone has any questions, yeah. We may have a few minutes here if, if somebody would like to ask any questions. Silva. What is the best way to get to know God? That is a, that is a very uh, great question. Um, it, it really is. And, and it's, it's a question that I've asked myself a lot. And I think has changed many times throughout my life. I think the best way to understand him is to live like him. Um, and that's, that's a kind of a, I hope that's not a cheap answer. Um, it, but it's the best one that I've come up with over my life. Um, I, I read his words. I study the scriptures. I pray. And those things teach me about him. But I, I don't think I ever, I don't think I understand him the same way I do when I live the way he lives. Um, when, when I live by the commandments, when I, when I, um, serve other people. I think the Savior, the, our Heavenly Father, when he, when he gave us the commandments, I think in essence what he was saying is, if, if you want to live like me, you want to be happy, you want to understand the joy that I understand, then live the way I live. And here's how I live. And so as we do that, as we strive to do that, I think that's the best way that we come to know him is by living like him. Great answer. Any other questions? Well, if we don't have any other questions, um, thank you again very much, Spencer, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to have you here with us. I just want to remind everybody that we have another uh, webinar devotional like this in two weeks on December 22nd with Daniel Smith. Uh, those of you who were at our summer program in Albania this last summer uh, will know that he's a, a great teacher as well, and we're sure to have a wonderful, wonderful experience with him next, uh, uh, well, the next uh, devotional in two weeks on the 22nd. Um, also, I noticed we have a, a few people that are new with us today. Um, if you're interested in coming to Komora Academy, uh, be sure to visit our website and uh, register for either the winter semester or the spring semester coming up. If that works in with your plans and schedule, uh, we'd love to have you here with us. And with that, I think I'd like to call on uh, Karina Oman for the closing prayer, if she can. Sure. Uh, okay, thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to um, listen to Spencer's talk and to hear his testimony. We are so grateful for um, this opportunity to um, test our faith as well. And we are so grateful for the experience that we can gain when we uh, follow your word. And we, we ask you for the strength those, uh, so we can um, do what you want us to do and to be worthy of um, the Holy Ghost, his uh, partnership. And uh, we, we love you and we say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Spencer. Thanks,